Today, we're covering five cold cases solved years later. Let's get right into it. Number five, Osmond Bell. Osmond Bell, the odd case of a man being brought to justice for murder by his own chewing gum. On the 27th of July, 1981, Nova Welsh was dead. She was murdered by pressure to the neck, but she was not found until three weeks later when her body was discovered mercilessly shoved in a cupboard. She was murdered in her flat in Lighthorn Avenue, Ladywood, after a past of domestic... Who was committing this? Ab Osmond Bell, a man that Nova had broken away from and tried to start a new life without. She had a new boyfriend, and she kept her two children, both of whom were Osmonds. For years and years, no one knew who killed Nova Welsh. There was an investigation done on Osmond Bell, but he was found not guilty. Confused and astonished, the case went on for 35 years. The killer never found by police. Evidence was hard to come by, especially because Nova's body was found three weeks after she died in her cupboard. That was until evidence was finally found. Pointing the finger straight at Osmond Bell, a former television engineer, he was subjected to four days of torturous and dark interrogation, according to the suspect himself. As he was interrogated, more evidence continued to surface that pointed to Osmond, including an anonymous letter written to the police station with his DNA on it. He denied that he wrote the letter, claiming that he had been able to see it during a break between police interrogation. Growing more suspicious, authorities kept looking. Then they found the damning evidence of it all. Chewing gum. Chewing gum with Osmond's DNA on it was found, stuck to the cupboard that was used to secure the lock that kept Nova's body secure and hidden. Osmond Bell, now 60, was the prime suspect of the murder, all evidence directing to him, no matter how much he claimed that he did not do it. In defense, Osmond hurriedly made excuses, but none of them were believed especially after authorities ruled that he most likely had murdered his ex in a panic since Osmond Bell's record was spotless before this and he demonstrated good character otherwise. Osmond was ruled guilty with manslaughter by majority juror vote and was told that he would spend half of his lengthy sentence in jail and half of it out of jail. Now that Osmond has been brought to justice, Lorna Welsh, Nova's mother, says that the family can now have closure knowing the person who took Nova's life has been brought to justice, according to the BBC article on the matter. Nova can finally rest in peace. The case demonstrates the fact that the smallest bits of evidence can contribute towards something much bigger. For example, chewing gum was all it took to sentence Osmond Bell, a man that got away with murder for 35 years with a clean record. Number 4. Pamela Rose Aldridge McCall Pamela Rose Aldrich McCall's temporarily cold-cased murder, the story of how a woman and her unborn child were finally given justice after around 28 years. On March 10th of 1991, Pamela Rose Aldrich McCall was found strangled in Spring Hill. She was pregnant at the time. The free-spirited woman often hitchhiked through Virginia and Tennessee. According to her mother in a 1991 newspaper, I gave her birth in air, and he takes the air out of her. That's what makes me mad. He's still breathing. But even while the authorities and McCall's mother desperately searched for clues that could lead them to a potential killer, they found nothing, no one. So the case was closed not too long after, serving Pamela and her unborn baby no justice. Until it did. At this point, you're probably asking who killed her. Was it another family member? Or maybe she died accidentally. It was nothing of the sort. Actually, it was a random truck driver that McCall had the misfortune of coming across while hitchhiking in 1991. Clark Perry Baldwin was connected to two murders, both of which were young women. One woman was found in March of 1992 in southern Wyoming on Interstate 80 by a female truck driver. She was nude and her cause of death was ruled to most likely be consistent head trauma and strangulation. 
but it was hard to tell after the body had sat in the snow for weeks on end. The other woman was pregnant, just like Pamela Rose Aldridge McCall. The woman was found dead near Sheridan in northern Wyoming. Her case is even fuzzier, and it is unknown what the true cause of her death is, but it is believed to be a blow to the head based on an injury that led authorities to that conclusion. Even so, neither of the women were ever identified, earning the nicknames I-90 Jane Doe and Bitter Creek Betty. Both were most likely older teens or young adults. Baldwin was charged with both deaths from DNA evidence and the location of the murders. Their bodies were found around 400 miles apart from one another. Baldwin's DNA was found on all three murder scenes, including the one of Pamela Rose Aldrich McCall's. In the court case documents, a woman claimed that Baldwin had assaulted her in a way we can't exactly say on YouTube and then bound her hands and mouth before trying to strangle her. This claim was never further explored after the victim refused to return to Texas. Baldwin, being a truck driver from Martin Transport, had easy access to many states. He lived in Iowa and Missouri, but unsolved cases from around the country could be potentially tied to him due to his access in every state. Baldwin was arrested after they found that the DNA evidence linked up to him. Pamela's mother said she thought she would never see justice for her daughter and grandchild, according to an interview where Brent Cooper, the attorney general of the 22nd Judicial District in Tennessee, said she thought that she would go to her grave never knowing who killed her daughter and grandchild. The case that was once closed was finally solved with an arrest, bringing Lyle peace and the knowledge that her daughter's killer is finally behind bars where he belongs. It is unknown how many cold cases could also be connected to Baldwin, but authorities claim that there are definitely more women that have never been discovered. Number 3. Pamela Chrysler The case of Pamela Chrysler, the time a single drop of blood solved a case that lasted for 15 years. In the hot, humid summer heat of Athens, a police officer arrived at the College Place Apartments on West Broad Street on August 21, 2002. He was there because he received a call concerning apartment 408, which had been reported to have had a foul smell at the time. The officer, James Moss, found a body within a few steps into the home, and from there, he immediately began investigating the violent murder with the help of two other officers and the coroner in the town. The corpse was identified to be a 49-year-old woman named Pamela Chrysler a homeless, jobless woman that had been staying in an apartment with the permission of the renter, Charles Elam Jr. Charles was away visiting family in Florida, so he was not there when the body was found. There was blood all around the house, and Pamela's body was found in the bedroom where she had been stabbed 20 times in the body and the neck. She had defensive cuts on her hands, and she was only in underwear when she was found. The case eventually went cold as no new evidence was turning up concerning the whereabouts of Pamela's killer. All that was left of the scene was blood and the body. There was no evidence pointing to any suspect or theories. That's what the police thought anyway. After 15 years with no solid proof pointing to any suspect, the case seemed very much unsolvable. Authorities were confused and discouraged, the case going cold with Pamela Chrysler's corpse. Pamela had spent some time doing mental health services as well as astrological readings, but she never held a steady job nor a steady home, leaving her rental with thousands of dollars of debt trailing behind her. Pamela's justice seemed doomed and impossible due to the lack of evidence other than her own blood, which was spewed across the entire tiny apartment before her tragic death. Justice seemed far away until December of 2017 where the case took an unexpected twist in the form of a single droplet of blood. A single drop of blood was found on a newspaper in the apartment in which Pamela was killed, the DNA differing from Pamela's own. This was not new evidence. It was found in December of 2003, but the difference was to whom the blood sample belonged. The blood sample suggested it came from a male, but still, no one knew where the killer was now, nor who it was. 
many witnesses' memories had become fuzzy, some of them moving or dying as well. The evidence was vital. First, authorities needed to figure out to whom exactly the DNA belonged before they could make any sort of assumption about the case itself. The blame fell onto Charles Elam Jr., the man that let Pamela stay in his home. He claimed that he had nothing to do with the murder and went to Florida on August 6, 2002. He did point to a crucial witness, though. He reported to the police that a young girl, a 19-year-old student of the University of Georgia, reported that she saw a black or Hispanic male lugging an orange vacuum cleaner from the apartment. Authorities were able to report that the vacuum cleaner was stolen from Charles on the night of the murder and that the vacuum cleaner was pawned away by a black male not too long after. The pawn shop owner said that the black male that appeared to be in his 20s was not suspicious when he sold the owner the vacuum. Even so, nothing new came about the evidence that was found about Pamela's murder. The confusing reel of evidence led to nothing. Until it did. In September 2017, Abdus Salam LaRoque was arrested for the possession of methamphetamine and a DVD copyright violation. He pleaded guilty to these charges, and therefore his DNA was taken into the system. Three months later, the DNA from LaRoque was matched with the DNA from Pamela Chrysler's murder scene. More specifically, the single droplet of blood that rested on the newspaper. After a police interview and multiple witness claims, LaRoque was eventually found guilty. His friend admitted that a drunken LaRoque had confessed to killing Pamela while he lived in the same apartment complex she was staying in during the year of 2002. LaRoque was arrested and charged with 40 years. Number 2. Sheila Keen Warren the odd case of Sheila Keen Warren, otherwise known as the Clown Murder. On May 26, 1990, Marlene Warren was approached by a clown on her doorstep in Wellington. The clown proceeded to hand her flowers, and it all seemed like a friendly gesture, possibly a friend dressed in a costume or someone in a suit paid by a friend or family member to cheer up the 40-year-old mother. Marlene was shot in the face a few seconds later by the clown, and she died in the hospital two days later. Her son was in the home and got a vague impression of what the clown looked like on the day of his mother's murder, but he and his girlfriend were the only witnesses. The clown sped away in a car, and that was it. Marlene was dead, by a clown no less. One of the first suspects in the case was Marlene's husband, Michael Warren. Michael had not been a loyal lover during their marriage, and Marlene reportedly told family members that if anything happened to her, her husband was the one that did it. Others say that Michael asked them what would happen to a wife's estate if her husband were to kill her. Michael has not been arrested on any charges, and the case is of course still ongoing. So there definitely is still a possibility that Michael Warren could have had something to do with Marlene's murder. Though Michael is not the prime suspect, his now wife, Sheila Keen Warren, is. Sheila worked for Michael at the time of Marlene's unfortunate death, and they were having an affair, which would give Sheila a motive in murdering Michael's wife. The two got married quietly and moved away from Wellington. A piece of hair found in the getaway car of the clown connected Sheila to the murder, and she was quickly arrested from her home in Virginia with Michael. Her trial is still ongoing, so her sentence is not official yet. Her trial has been postponed due to the coronavirus pandemic. The death penalty has been ruled out, so there is no telling if Sheila definitely committed the murder or if Michael is connected to it. Marlene's son and his girlfriend at the time claimed that the clown was a male with bright blue eyes, neither of which matched Sheila. Hopefully, we will get updates and a clear conclusion to the case soon. Number 1. Joseph Henry Loveless Joseph was born in 1870 in Utah, where his parents were devoted to the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. He had one child with his ex-wife and four with his second wife, Agnes Octavia Caldwell. Joseph made multiple escapes from jail from 1913 onward, where he was arrested for bootlegging. He was a master at escaping from the jail bars, sawing through the bars holding him captive in one instance. He was arrested multiple times after, but still managed 
to always find a way to escape rotting in prison. Even on May 11, 1916, when Joseph was arrested for his wife Agnes's murder, his children were still skeptical about him actually staying in jail. His daughter allegedly claimed that she knew he would be back shortly. Even so, authorities hoped they had finally caught the man that continued to make his escape from the jail. They thought they finally had him handled. Imagine their surprise when sure enough, a few days later, Joseph escaped from his cell once again, most likely sawing away at the bars. He was on the run, which was not a surprise to his family or most of Utah. Because they did not find Joseph for so long, they assumed he had successfully gotten a new identity and was living a second life elsewhere. The case went cold and they eventually stopped looking for Joseph, the man that made so many desperate escapes that he finally succeeded. That is until Joseph Henry Lovelace's body was found in a cave 68 years after his disappearance. It is believed that Joseph did not live long after his escape, but it is unknown how his remains actually got to the cave, nor who moved them there, making the case technically unsolved. His torso was the first part of his body found, which was in a burlap sack thrown into the cave. In 1991, an 11-year-old girl discovered his limbs. Once the DNA comparison evidence from his grandchild confirmed that the body parts did in fact come from Joseph Henry Lovelace, many began searching for his skull, which was never found. Anthony Redgrave, an employee of the DNA Doe Project, said this about the discovery. In all likelihood, Henry had been murdered and transported to the cave not long after he escaped, making his post-mortem interval, the time between his death and discovery of his body, as long as 63 years. This case has been historic in more than one meaning of the word. If you enjoyed this video, be sure to hit the like button and subscribe. A playlist is going to pop up right now with more videos you'll love. See you guys next time.